is our foremost designer. He goes out on site. Uh, he's been with us for many, many years. A gardener extraordinaire, but he's got an eye for architecture, balance, feng shui thing. He just he just puts it all out there. So he's he's got a great design eye. Michelle is my right hand person for. Basically, she helps me run the garden center. Everything this half of the garden center, that's hers. She controls, absolutely controls all of it. If you want to know what's coming or going, don't talk to me. I talk to her. That's, that's Michelle. So she's been a manager with us, been in the industry for decades. With, with us, darn close to it. But anyway, tons of experience. So I'm sure even I will pick up a few things as I listen in and tune in. So would you give it up for Doug and Michelle? And Hello, welcome. Um, we appreciate you guys coming out. Um, hopefully we're all getting some rain. We're excited about that. Monsoon season's finally here. Yay! Um, so everybody get out and do the rain dance and everything so we can keep it going. Um, one thing we want to start off with is kind of what Ken mentioned. Prescott, Arizona is unlike anywhere else you have ever been. Um, we have different seasons. Um, we have different altitude, uh, humidity levels. So all of these are factors in, um, uh, all of these are factors in, uh, how to grow here. So we're going to go through uh, seasons, um, we're going to go, how, uh, go through how to plant, what to look for in a plant, um, some of our uh, pro uh, problematic issues um, between the animals and insects and fungal issues, all of that. Um, so uh, we'll try to go through our spiel and then um, if you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. We'll try to get to them as much as we can. Um, if our time allotted uh, runs out, uh, we will be around after the fact and we'll try to answer as much as we can. So the, the premise of the class really is that most of us have probably learned to garden somewhere else. And now we're here and things are different and you might as well as newcomer find out what's different uh, through a class through some form of education rather than through trial and error so as michelle mentioned we'll cover um, altitude temperature sunshine uh, seasons animals soil kind of the whole gamut of what why gardening is different here and what you can do to be more successful what plants do well we'll cover some of the that we have here, as well as our products and best practices. So, Michelle, what do we start with? Uh, let's start out with uh, Prescott, Arizona. So, we are a mile high um, in altitude, which means we have very high intensity sunshine. Um, we also have a very lack of, uh, or a lack of humidity for like nine months out of the year. Um, usually during our monsoon season is when the, uh, the humidity level will go up. Humidity, plants love the humidity, which is why you can spit a seed out in Oregon and California and Virginia and everything grows. Here, not so much. Um, so those uh, factors are huge on the difference in planting here. Uh, the other thing is, is our soil basically is non-existent. Um, it's basically dead. There's no, uh, not a lot of elements in there. Um, our pH level is super, super high, which also causes a problem because most plants like that more balanced um, alkalinity. Um, so we do have some uh, tough times ahead and this summer has been brutal. Um, every one of us, even our season, seasoned gardeners like us, we've lost stuff. I mean, it's just been brutal. So gardening is one of those things that you take with a grain of salt. You know, just because something died doesn't mean you necessarily failed. There are other reasons for it. But if you're a true gardener, you just keep trying, you know, and it's just, you, you learn to live with it. And it's one of those things we get used to. And we, we learn by experience and, and trial and error. We learn what can actually grow in our place and what doesn't. So 
um, we're going to try to help you through that. So as an example of what Michelle's talking about, I used to always grow a lot of basil because my wife was a pesto queen. She's since resigned that role, but so I don't grow as much basil. But I would plant it maybe at the beginning of June and water it every single day because it was hot and dry and windy. And it, you know, would just kind of plug along, wouldn't do too much. The month of June is really brutal here because it's hot and dry. You get this southwesterly wind that comes through all the time. And uh, plants are just kind of hang in there. Uh, this year, that's sort of extended into July and August, unfortunately. But once, back to my basil crop, once it started raining and we got some humidity, they just took off. And so they were just kind of in neutral, growing slowly, not doing too much through the whole month of June. And then early July, monsoons came and it created this humidity. So we can water our plants every day, flood them, but we can't provide them with the humidity that they need, which is most of the time is lacking here. We have very low humidity, as you probably noticed, but it does have an effect on plants and how they grow. So a little bit about seasonality in this area. So um, we have uh, three different growing seasons here. So. Um, Springtime, uh, we start with cool season vegetables. So, like your lettuce, your chard, beets, onions, all of that, peas, all of that stuff, you can actually plant in March um, and actually get a full crop out of it before the heat rises. Um, the summer crop season, our last frost date is usually around Mother's Day. Um, so your hot season vegetables, tomatoes, peppers, all of that uh, can be planted out in the ground after Mother's Day. Even then, you kind of want to keep your eye on the weather report because we have had frosts up till uh, Memorial Day. Um, so pay attention, kind of keep an eye on that. Um, this last year, I actually brought tomatoes in in March um, because of the whole COVID thing and everything else. Everybody decided to be a home gardener and it was great. Um, we had so many new people interested in gardening. It, it was just a influx of vegetables that I couldn't, I couldn't keep enough in here. Um, and we're going to probably do the same thing next year. Um, I have actually contract grow, uh, grows in for tomatoes and peppers and strawberries coming in in, in the end of uh, March. So we look forward to all that. Um, so summer season uh, starts uh, Mother's Day. Um, like I said, you, you've got some wiggle room in there. Um, there are ways of protecting your stuff. A lot of people have homemade greenhouses um, that they can protect. Um, tomatoes and peppers don't like temperatures, nighttime temperatures below 50, which can cause issues in itself. They kind of stunt their growth. They won't grow as fast. Um, sometimes it'll it'll just struggle for another month if it gets caught into that cycle. Uh, so. Um, we go through the summer um, now uh, end of august we're back into the cool season vegetable time so um, over there i have a very small because um, i was waiting for the heat to break um, selection of like broccoli and cabbage uh, onions um, i have all sorts of herbs right now uh, so Next week, I'll have a whole lot more um, because it looks like our temperature is finally going to go down a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, so um, seasonality uh, is great here. Uh, so we have all of that to look forward to. I don't know if we have these yet, but I've always had good success with uh, red romaine lettuce that we usually have here. and. Uh, Plant it every fall. Even we even grow enough planter, and it's it, it'll do well uh, way into uh, cold weather. After you get a couple of freezes, that sort of cool season crop will kind of fade away. But you can still get a pretty good several months of all those leafy greens. So the fall garden that Michelle's talking about includes lettuce, spinach, chard, uh, bok choy, broccoli, um, whole slew. Celery takes a long time to 
grown. It, it, uh, most potatoes is a March thing. Um, so yeah, those you can plant. Um, what is the there's a, there's a wide tale about uh, St. Patrick's Day um, and potatoes. So that's a good time to get those in. I would imagine you could still get a crop. I mean, we've got three months, so we still have that time. So throw them in. You never know. Why not? <laughs> Um, our last frost date um, is, or our first frost in the fall is usually around Halloween-ish. Um, that's kind of when everybody starts turning off their sprinkler systems, shutting their valves down. Um, just because we shut our water down doesn't necessarily mean we need to stop watering. Um, so I'm going to get on my high horse, unless you want to get on there. your high horse, because I do this just about every week. And we'll talk a little bit about watering. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Water is something that we talk about every single day. Yes. Yeah. So, and especially um, this time of year. Exactly. Uh, so, watering here is one of those things you don't have to water every day. Even though we are 100 degrees, that moisture level under your soil is well, kind of stay wet. Your top three or four inches, yes, that'll dry out instantly. And those folks that water daily for five minutes, you're, you're just wasting water because it's like taking a small Dixie cup of water and tossing it on your plant. It's not doing anything. Um, so watch your watering. Basically established plants only need to be watered once a week as long as you're doing it deeply enough. And I can't stress, volume is the key word. The timer, it doesn't matter how, if, if you're running it five minutes and you have a one gallon emitter, it, it's not giving the plant, and you're running it for 15 minutes, you're not doing, I mean, you're getting it a quarter of a gallon. I mean, it, if you think about it in volume, it, it makes more sense. Um, I'm going to pass these cards around. These are Ken's cards, um, or all of our business cards. They have a watering guide on the back of them. So newly uh, established plants once a week. Um, kind of gauge a, a foot and a half uh, uh, of height. You want to do a gallon of water. Um, so kind of do it with a rule of thumb. The bigger it is, the more you need to water. Drip lines. Those of you that have a tree this size and your drip lines are right there at the trunk, you're not watering your tree. You're, you're watering the ground underneath it, you're not watering your tree. So the drip lines are the furthest most points of your tree. So if your tree is, has a 20 foot span, you should be out at that 20 foot level. So you need to increase your spaghetti tubes, add, a bunch more so you only have to water you know an hour at a time um, and put five gallon or get the adjustable ones where you can do um, 10 gallons at a time if you have huge trees um, new plantings we always say water twice a week um, and that kind of goes with the grain of thought um, because we have so many different soil types in this area um, if you're up at Thumb Butte, you basically have a DG, a decomposed granite. Um, in Quailwood, Chino, Prescott Valley, we have clay, heavy, heavy clay. Most of that heavy clay soils hold that moisture in longer. So when we tell you to water twice a week, that doesn't mean just set your system up and we're gonna just water it, because Michelle said so. Um, check it on that second time day that week if it is still moist and you do that for a couple of weeks in a row you have pretty heavy clay soil and just set it up for once a week it's okay just because i said twice a week doesn't mean you have to water twice a week so kind of use um, some common sense um, as far as if a plant is moist don't water it um, most of us are nurturers, and as soon as a plant kind of wilts, we just want to water. And sometimes wilting can be from overwatering. Um, brown leaves can be from overwatering. So stick your fingers in the ground. Um, I would tell you to buy a moisture meter. We've been out of them for about a month and a half now um, because with everything going on, supply chains are broken down and we can't get them. 
Um, so use your finger. This is the best moisture meter you'll ever have. Um, pop a screwdriver in the ground about six inches and, and kind of feel down there. You will know if you, basically if you pull a piece of soil out and it crumbles in your hand, you, you're dry, you need to water. If it kind of holds its shape nicely, you're perfect, leave it alone. If it, you squeeze it and water comes out, stop watering, um, at least for a few days. And then just check it again. Um, pay attention to your plants so you know what you're doing. Um, for lawns, again, twice a week, it, as long as you're watering deeply enough, that gets your root systems going down um, deeper. Um, which helps through the, the drought periods when we're at 100 degrees. If you have a very big, large root system, it's going to handle our 100 degrees days. Um, newly planted plants, vegetables, gardens and stuff, those are the ones that you probably have to water every other day, maybe two or three times a week. Again, use your fingers, feel the soil. We have a, um, on a website there's a garden talk section, and there's, I believe, a hand out there that's called Watering Wisely. Mm -hmm. And it has a lot of detail on how you can test your soil, what's going in your yard for uh, to, to, to monitor your mod watering needs. Unfortunately, there's no simple answer that works for everybody as far as how much water do I put on this tree. Well, it, it depends a lot on where the tree is, uh, the climate, the soil, etc. Last summer, a gentleman came in and uh, he had a photo on his phone of his blue spruce and he said, he was kind of unhappy and he said, my blue spruce is turning brown, it just looks really unhealthy, even though I water it every day for five minutes. And so I said, okay, well, that's not really the best approach. Why don't you try watering it um, you know, once every week or 10 days for an hour and a half? And he looked at me like I was crazy, you know? So finally I, I explained to him why I made that suggestion. He was talking about a 10-foot tree that's, a, you know, yay wide and probably has roots going down about this far. Five minutes with a hose standing there barely even gets to the roots. So you have to, you know, generally the rule of thumb is the more <clears throat> mature a tree or a shrub is, then the less frequently you want to water, but you want to do it for a longer duration. So but you have to kind of, if you look at the watering wisely, do the testing that Michelle's talking about, you can determine, try and assess what's going on. Uh, because just, we, we all have this tendency, we as gardeners, if something doesn't look good, we water it more. When in fact the problem can be that it's already getting too much water. So it's a, it's, it's a tough question, but one that I think with some uh, in practice you can become informed about. And if you are new to your particular property, um, it's always a good thing to actually do a perk test. And basically what a perk test is, is you kind of dig a hole where you want to plant something. Um, when you plant something here, you want to dig the hole twice as wide as the bucket that it's in. So if I was going to plant this, we'd go this wide, just as deep as it's sitting in this bucket. We don't want to go any deeper. Um, a lot of us would like to open this up so the roots could go down, but the problem is is that um, plants will sink um, and then you'll end up with this hole and you'll end up with uh, root rot. Um, so that's, you want to plant everything even. If you're going to make a mistake, you want to actually be up uh, on, uh, so the root ball is actually above the ground a little bit. It's okay if it's showing um, because plants do like to uh, dry out in between watering. And basically with the perk test, you fill that hole up with water and you wait and see how long take a look at the clock and see how long it takes for it to actually drain out of there. Um, if it is gone within four to six hours, you are okay. Um, you're good to go plant a tree. Um, if it's there more than that, uh, you probably want to find another hole uh, for that tree or create a berm uh, so it has a little bit better drainage for that. Uh, raised beds or something in, to that fact. Um, so if you are new to your area, that's a, always a good thing to try. Can you touch a little bit on the 
gardening? Sure. Um, she, she wants us to touch a little bit about container gardening. And it's kind of the same principle. Um, one being that um, potting soils um, have a lot of peat moss in them. And so they tend to hold that moisture in pretty well. Um, so I always tell people to definitely check your pots. Your bigger pots aren't going to dry out as much as your smaller pots are. So if you're just kind of watering everything all the, you know, at the same rate at the same time, kind of pay attention. Your big ones aren't going to need as much as often as your smaller ones. Um, that also being said, um, a little bit of if, if something is just kind of looking stressed, just a little bit of water um, can help um, instead of flooding the whole thing. You know, just give it enough to pop it up and it, it should be fine. Um, wilting is one of those things that we wilt when it's 100 degrees. How do you feel when it's 100 degrees? You kind of feel, uh, um, So if your plants kind of wilt in the evening, don't uh, and they come back at night when it cools off, let them be. Um, if they're still wilted after uh, the, it gets cool, then you, yeah, you might need to water. Um, so a little wilting is okay. Don't, don't, don't fret about it. And you know, some folks uh, asking about container gardening is, is apropos because some people, maybe they don't have much growing space or their yard is so full of clay and rock that it's not feasible to plant in the ground, they they plant in pots or boxes or you know old wine barrels. That's a good choice. As an example, over there we have blueberries. A lot of people just say, I've struggled to find blueberries in the ground because the ground is too alkaline. Blueberries like an acidic soil. So let's just grow them in a pot. And then you can also move the pot around. Uh, you know, during the season you want more or less sun. I mean if it's not too heavy of course. And that gives you that option. Incidentally, speaking of container gardening, uh, there's a class that Lisa Lane does a couple times a year where she talks about container gardening and she's really knowledgeable about that. There's also a hands-on type class where you can come in and you, uh, she talks for a while, then you go and pick your plants, put them in a pot, and you go home with your own little container. So it's a lot of fun because it isn't just us talking with you, everybody goes out and Fix the plants and comes yeah. home with their own unique. We did creation. that a couple of times last, or well, last year. But with the, everything that's going on, we, we're trying to limit it groups. Um, not that I don't like seeing all of you, but we 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 really miss having people here. Um, it's kind of what we do. So hopefully, once this whole thing changes, we can start doing more of that hands-on um, classes and uh, stuff like that. Um, Container gardening um, is great uh, because it, you don't have to dig a hole. Um, and you can do just about anything in a pot. Um, Lisa and Ken have fruit trees in pots. Um, they have, and, and it's really easy to pick. Um, you just have to get the right size pot for, for the tree um, and just kind of keep it pruned and everything is going to be fine. Uh, did that answer basically your question? Okay. Um, again, about planting, um, when you dig your hole, um, you want to go twice as wide, just as deep. You want to mix two-thirds of your natural soil, and yes, it's nasty, but the trees actually got to get used to living in there because you can't just haul in a whole bunch of new dirt for it to live in. Um, so it, they have to get used to what you have. Um, and then one-third premium mulch. Um, our mulch is actually a compost-based uh, substance, so it helps break up clay soils. Um, for our uh, DG folks it, or sandy folks, um, it helps add some organic matter, so it has moisture holding powers. So the mulch is really important. Um, fertilization is also important, and our 744, Fertilizer is, uh, Ken actually formulated this for up here. Um, it is mostly cottonseed meal uh, and some other ingredients. So it's organic. Um, it doesn't have the seal, but it is completely organic. It's people and pet friendly. 
Um, so we just throw it around the, the planting hole. It will not burn. Um, the directions are on here. So it's usually two cups per inch of caliper on your um, trees. Um, shrubs get a cup and a half, two cups, uh, kind of depending on your size. We do this three or four times a year. Three um, for deciduous stuff, the stuff that's going to lose their leaves. Um, Easter, 4th of July, and Halloween. And then for evergreens, we actually add a New Year's uh, dose for them. Um, because deciduous stuff shuts down when the leaves drop and then starts back up in the spring. So the dose that you give it in the fall lasts throughout that spring, gets it going in the spring, and then it, the dose that in March gets you through summer. Does it talk about the fines on the package? No, um, but just remember your holidays. Um, it's really easy, or if you're an accountant, remember your quarters. Um, however you want to do it. it, it's not rocket science, so if you miss it by a month, just as long as you do it, that's what's important. Um, lastly, when you plant uh, root and grow, um, that is behind Doug. Um, root and grow is a substance that we came up with that um, helps reduce stress uh, in times of the heat, transplant shock. Um, so it does all that stuff. Uh, so with woody stuff, your trees, your shrubs, uh, you want to do it for six weeks time, um, every two weeks for six weeks, so three times. Um, all my plants, like the perennials, the smaller stuff, I usually just do it once and I'm done with them, um, just to get them started with that. Uh, so um, root and grow, and then staking your trees is really, really important if you're doing uh, trees. We get such a heavy southwest wind um, basically from March till June. Usually when monsoon season hits it kind of slows down a little bit. We still get wind but it's, it's not as constant as it is between March and June. Um, so staking is very important. Our trees need to move a little bit and that helps strengthen the trunk but we don't want the root ball to move so staking a tree is really really important. So I thought since a couple of you asked about irises, we just changed the topic a bit. Uh, irises can do well here. One advantage is animals mostly don't like them. We don't really carry bulbs here, uh, but um, if you plant tulips, and tulips are wonderful, but Havelina love tulips, and they will go great lengths to uh, eat your tulips. Not so much with irises. Irises need to be separated every three years or so. And then if you dig them out of the ground, you clean them up, you cut them back, you make them smaller. Uh, we have a handout again on Garden Talk about that. There's also an organization called the Prescott Iris Society uh, that you can get information there on how to separate. Uh, it's really basically just cut them. I found that when I separate my irises, you know, it's kind of a chore to get them out of the ground because the ground is kind of hard. So I'll just add some of our um, mulch or potting soil on top. Instead of trying to dig them up back into the ground, I just bring the ground to the rhizome. They don't have to be in the ground very deep. About three inches, you can barely cover them. That's fine. So you'll find that most irises, uh, will, will, all irises, will benefit from being separated. And you may find also that you're going to need, after you take them all out, cut them up, you're going to need more space. You'll have more <laughs> rhizomes than you have space. So think in terms of maybe where else you might plant some irises, and that's how they kind of expand and grow. And they should do well here. They, they uh, usually flower in late April. Um, a couple years ago, uh, I, was, I was out of town, and the, the irises flowered. I came home, they looked beautiful. But two weeks later, we had a 45-minute hailstorm, which took care of all the flowers. Unfortunately, but at least I had them for a couple of weeks and it didn't damage the plants. It's just that the flowers were kind of shredded. So since a couple of you asked about irises, yes, they'll do well here. And they, just, they have kind of a short, you know, one month to six week flowering season. And then, then they're back to just being kind of like perennial plants. And other bulbs that do well, uh, the daffodils uh, are one that you can plant that the animals stay away from. Um, like Doug said, you put your tulips and, 
anything else uh, of that sort closer to your house or somewhere protected because deer and rabbits, everything will eat the irises, squirrels. Um, but the, the, the daffodils are, are tough uh, little cookies and, and they, they can survive and everything. Um, also put a little bit of bone meal in the bottom of the holes uh, when you plant your irises. That helps get your root system going and boost the flower power in the spring. Uh, so those are both good product, or that is a good product to use uh, during that. Um, well, if you've just moved to a property recently, it's important to try and figure out what animals travel through your backyard if you're not fenced in. If you're not fenced in, there will be animals in your backyard. You can count on that. It could be javelina, it could be deer. Most likely there are rabbits as well. If you have all of those, good luck. You're, you're in, in store for a challenge as far as gardening. Now, a lot of times uh, people, will, you know, we have lists that say deer won't eat these and javelina won't eat these. Uh, it's, you know, it's kind of like a suggested sort of thing. There's no guarantee. And it's no, there isn't a whole lot of overlap. However, if you want plants that you can be pretty sure all animals will stay away from, think herbal. Over here to my right is an autumn sage. So, and there's rosemary back there. So lavender, rosemary, sage. Anything that's herbal, they're going to stay away from. This autumn sage, hummingbirds love them, but Havelina won't touch them. So there's, and we have a whole class of kendas, um, gophers and other animals. One year I had a wonderful crop of red potatoes. I was just getting ready to harvest them. And guess what? The gophers decided to beat me to the punch by about one day. So I went out to the bed and there were a couple of potato plants left, you know, but that was about it. So it's, it is definitely a challenge. So it's a question like we we're talking about watering wisely. You know what the animals are. They're going to travel through at night. Maybe you've got video cameras, talk to the neighbors. You know, I talked to some people who say, I don't have animals in my neighborhood I'm thinking, really, where do you live? It's, maybe I'll move there. You know, it's like people saying we don't have we don't have insects in my yard. What kind of yard do you have? I mean, I, I, maybe I could I buy your house and move in and start gardening. So it, it, it's a challenge and I'm not trying to, you know, discourage you and so on. It's just something you have to be aware of uh, and you plant so that you can try and work around that. Um, because it's kind of discouraging you come in here, buy a whole lot of plants, put them in the ground. They can be gone overnight down to the nubs, basically. Or nubs. ripped completely out. Ripped out. A lot of times, javelina will just come through your yard. It could be a whole pack, a hungry family. And sometimes it takes them a while to figure out that they don't like something. But, but in the process of rooting it up, they may destroy the plant. So, um, as I say, the whole other class and how to deal with animals, this doesn't even cover insects. We're talking about mammals, mostly. Uh, and that's just a part of gardening here. Um, another issue that we tend to have here, we do have bugs. Um, early in the spring, we get drip. Um, they are a very small, tiny, little, skinny little bug that you barely can see. Um, thrips are nasty little boogers that get into trees. Um, they, they get in as a tree starts to bud and they will eat the, the tissue around there. Um, when the tree leaps out, you'll get that curly, um, crinkled look on your, like your pear trees this year. Every pear tree in town, I think, ended up with thrift. Um, at least the houses that I went to. Uh, Mine do. <laughs> his does. Um, some of the, the, the peach trees can do it. Um, even uh, red buds can get it. Um, a couple of ways to kind of keep those at bay is if you put dormant oil early in the spring when the trees are bare, um, hence the dormant oil. Um, it, it basically coats the tree uh, and anything that's laying dormant on there, whether it's eggs, uh, bug eggs or fungal issues, it, it, it will keep that, um, it'll smother it so it, it will die. Um, that being said, just because you do that doesn't necessarily mean you won't ever get um, bugs or thrips or fungal issues. Um, because most of these things fly in with the wind um, or come up through the soil and the wind catches them, bird hops through and is on your tree. So it's one of those things where at, we, we as gardeners, uh, we should have a tool closet, um, we should have bug spray. 
uh, our insecticide, we should have um, weed control uh, in there and we should have a fungicide in there as well. Um, so all of these should be in your shed. Um, we do have products and I'm sitting on them. Um, Multi-purpose spray will work on uh, 100 plus insects. Uh, this will work on your thrips, your aphids. Uh, spider mites are tough. Um, this will work on spider mites, but usually takes a couple of times. Um, 38 plus is actually better for spider mites. It has 38% of the permethrin that's in here. Um, pine bark beetles, um, the plant protector will help that uh, those insects stay out of the trees um, because it gets into the cambium layer and it goes up into the tree um, and it, it will protect from that. Uh, pinion scale, uh, this is good for um, in the spring, you'll want to dose your pinions with this because it'll keep that scale from forming. Uh, also keeps uh, aphids and such off of um, aspens and, and maples. So anything that doesn't flower, you can definitely use it. Um, on some of your fruit trees, this will also keep borers out. Um, read the label because I can't remember exactly which trees it works on. I think it's the peaches. Um, it works well on, um, I think it's the apples that it doesn't. Um, but read the label to tell you exactly which trees you can actually use it for. Um, he was asking about what to use on vegetables. Um, there are garden dusts um, that you can actually, in, in crawly insects, uh, there's a garden dust down there that you just sprinkle on, um, or for grubs, I use that in my vegetable gardens for grubs, every once in a while they'll pop up. Um, you don't want to use a systemic on anything vegetable-wise that you're going to use. Um, this is permethrin, which is a crushed chrysanthemum, and that it works really well. You can use it up to harvest, just wash everything off. We have, we're, we're open here every, every day, nine to five, and Michelle or I, whoever's working that day, is always here to help you, walk you around, talk with you about plants. If you see trees and plants that you want, we have a service where we have a planting crew. They'll come out and plant the trees. And believe me, if you get a big 20-gallon pine tree, you may want some help. I wouldn't try uh, planting a tree in my yard. We have a crew of strong young guys that come out in the truck. They dig the holes in the ground. They do a good job. We also have a service, and Michelle and I do this as well. Uh, it's called a garden consultation, where we come out to your yard and talk about uh, your property, what you think about, what your goals, uh, is everything healthy, what are these plants, how do I treat them. Uh, we can uh, talk with you a little bit more about that afterward, but those are some of the things that we offer uh, at, here. We also have a, a personal shopper where you, for an hour, someone can take you around, you get undivided attention, when it's busy here, sometimes it's difficult to pay attention to one person for an extended period of time. But with a garden shopper, you can get to do that. So those are some of the things. I don't really know what, you know. There, there's so many people who have moved here from somewhere else that maybe they're not familiar with the plants. They, they bought a house, they've got a yard that, you know, landscape, so maybe some things are okay, some aren't. But for a lot of people, it's, what are they and how do I take care of them? And we, we can help with that. And we do, um, just as a, a company and all of our associates, um, if you have leaves that have weird spots on them or you think there's a bug on them put them in a plastic bag a ziploc bag and bring them in we have a wonderful microscope down uh, at the uh, store that we can take your leaves and look at them and we can tell you exactly what's on there um, it's amazing when you show these people these spider mites and on the micro or the screen it looks like it's this big but you can't see them with the naked eye so there are a lot of things that are out there that we, we can help you with um, it's a times 200 magnification. Yeah. So it, it makes the bugs look pretty big. <laughs> it's, it was one of the best tools Ken ever brought in here. It was amazing. Um, fertilizers, like you said, uh, the all-purpose fertilizer um, is uh, 
basically for everything. Um, we created that so you didn't have to go buy 15 different fertilizers for this, that, or the other. Um, he did create one uh, last year. It is a, a fruit and vegetable fertilizer. Um, basically, the difference is, is that it has an extra dose of calcium that helps fruits form better. Um, it helps prevent that uh, blossom end rot that tomatoes get, um, that black spot that forms on the bottom of your tomatoes, that's a lack of calcium. Um, container gardening, you always want to put some extra calcium in the bottom of your pole um, because potting soil has no nutrients in it. So you want to make sure there's calcium in there because tomatoes use it a lot. Um, squash can get that blossom end rot as well. When your fruit starts coming out and the end kind of crinkles up and just kind of fuzzes away, um, that is blossom end rot on squash. So um, the extra calcium will prevent that from happening. I think I'm sitting on the back of the fertilizer that Michelle's talking about. <laughs> it's, uh, it's for fruits and veggies. It's right here. Oh. And, oh um, we call this root stimulation. <laughs> One thing about this, it's got this calcium and a little bit of bone meal. Be careful about leaving it out if you have a dog. I think every dog that walks past this pallet of this stuff stops to sniff it. So, you know, it's okay if they sniff and lick it, just don't let them, you know, start feeding oh, it in the bag. And that goes for the other one as well. It does say people and pet friendly. Um, if they take a lick or two of the granules you've got on a sidewalk or something, it's not going to hurt them. But put the bag away high because they do like it, so they will try to eat it. And so, usually uh, just watering it in lightly after you've applied it will take care of that, yeah. so it's not going to be an issue. An issue. Yeah. Um, her question was, is what's the difference between potting soil and topsoil? So topsoil has actually been taken out of, a, out of the ground um, and basically added with a little bit of mulch and put in the bag. Um, the potting soil is more peat moss, it has perlite in it, um, so it it's a, allows plants that are in a small pot to drain well and so you only have to water it every so often. Um, so that's basically the difference. Um, most of your topsoil, <laughs> 10 minutes, okay. So topsoil has um, more nutrients in it than a potting soil does, but like I said, our, our, our water and our ground is just being, it, your plants will be happier for it. Um, I think before we finish up, um, we want to talk about a few plants um, here today, and then like I said, we can open it up for questions and, and we'll finish it up. Um, so Doug, pick two plants that you want to talk about. Okay, so here's one of them. This is a Petoni Aster. It's a great ground cover, and we have it in a couple different sizes and shrubs. There are many different versions of this plant. Um, some are going to be pretty low, some will get to be, you know, a foot or two high. They have a nice little white flower in the spring, as you can see, orange berries in the fall. Um, this particular Petoni Aster is the only one that is not decid or that is deciduous. So this one will actually lose its leaves. Uh, it's the cranberry Petoni Aster. The other varieties that Doug was talking about are like the Pearl Beauty, the Eckholtz, and then the Streeves. So Streeves is the short one that only gets like six inches. The Eckholtz gets about a foot, and then the, the Pearl Beauty gets about three. Uh, How about this one? Yeah. This plant that I knocked over, you can see it's still alive, actually. <laughs> um, this is called periwinkle, or uh, Lincoln, Lincoln Minor. And it's a wonderful plant if you want something that's going to spread out and fill in the space. In fact, I think the handout says it gets to be about six inches tall and spreads out indefinitely. But it grows best in the shade uh, all summer long, all year long, really, you get the green leaves and sometimes you get purple flowers. Don't let it get tangled up with your uh, other existing plants or you will have trouble separating It is very, them. very But it's a good ground <laughs> cover for a shady area. 
Um, speaking of shady areas, I just couldn't resist this um, pop of color. Um, this is a hydrangea, and yes, you can uh, grow these here, um, but you need some shade. Um, these do great in a shady spot where they're a little bit protected. Uh, it's that hot afternoon sun that most plants do not like. So one thing I will cautious, caution you is when you are reading tags, um, whether it's here or any other store, they make them for the entire country, not for Prescott, Arizona. So this guy says full sun. If you put this in full sun, he will die. Um, he will not be happy and he will die and you will think you failed, but it's because he was put in the wrong spot. So if you have questions, please ask us. Um, we try to keep them in a separate spot uh, so they're easy to find, but sometimes they get mixed up. Um, so just ask, that's what we're here for and, and we're happy to help. That yes, it will. It really likes a pot. It's kind of like the blueberries Doug mentioned. Um, blueberries are another one that like the shade, the afternoon shade. They don't like that hot afternoon sun. And it needs some acid. So even in a pot uh, or low, so we can lower that. Um, soil sulfur is a must even when you're watering afterwards. Our water has pH in it, and eventually your potting soil will be, uh, that level will raise up. So hydrangea is one of my favorite plants, and one of the reasons is, a few years ago, um, there was a woman approached me in Safeway, and I thought she looked familiar, but I wasn't sure, and she said, you helped me to pick out a hydrangea, and, and you told me how to take care of it, and it's doing really nicely. So thank you very much. I right? tell so thanks. Thank you for making my day. That's what we guest. try and do here. You know? I needed him last uh, week. <laughs> yeah. See these? Remember I mentioned hummingbirds here? We have them actually on the payroll. You know, we actually give them a whole extra nectar. So they're, they're, you know, we see hummingbirds, they like to come in and they feed. So people can see that's really happening. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm starting a vegetable garden. You know, I was just wondering if there's some other plants that I could plant around the vegetables to discourage bug infestation? Uh, his question was, Is uh, what else could he plant in a vegetable garden to discourage bugs? Um, marigolds uh, are uh, supposedly to keep bugs out. Um, so if you plant them strategically, that'll help. Um, citronella geraniums can help as well. Um, that's or lemongrass, anything that has that lemony scent, lemon balm, um, onions, great. Um, uh, so um, all of those things will, will keep bugs away. Yes? Yes and no. Um, so basically they're not supposed to come back. However, some of them are pretty strong and they will come back. Um, a lot of them do go to seed. Um, this is one of the uh, fall flowers that we bring in along with the pansies that will uh, make it through winter.